All right. How's everybody doing this morning? Good morning to all from wherever you're at. Um, I'm going to just do a real quick check here, make sure my audio is good, make sure the audio to this thing is good. Um, if you could just let me know. Um, can everybody hear me first and foremost? Okay. And I'm going to play a little bit of this audio here to this video before I get it started. It's a okay. Can everybody hear the audio to the video here? Let me get that thing back there. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay. Good. All right, we are going to get started. Um, just as little opening to this whole thing. Uh, this has been sent to me twice now. You know, one of you in the live stream said, you know, could you please debunk this? I forget who it was, but and then somebody had sent me this a while back, many months ago. Could you please debunk this thing? And I started going through it many months ago, and um, they're qu quoting new versions of the Bible, which creates a lot of confusion. Very hard to debunk a video like that because of the satanic nature of the new versions. They're created to cause division and the King James Bible. If you want sound Bible doctrine, the King James Bible is the way to go. I've even heard of lost uh, college professors that will say that, you know, for really deep theological study, you have to use the King James Bible. The new ones just mess up doctrine. So we'll see examples of that today. So that's why I've not debunked this thing yet, but um, I've had a lot of, People ask me if I would debate on different issues, and I've always said no to that. Not because I'm afraid of debating with somebody. What I'm afraid of is a lot of um, arguments just don't get out because there's a lot of emotion that comes into when you get into a debate, an organized debate. You know, it's your turn to speak, and then this guy says this, and that guy says that, and it's a lot. Um, it's a lot better to just let them put their work out and then I'll come out and I can put out a refutation of it or whatever else. So this is a form of debate. I'm going to be showing you from the scriptures why they are dead wrong. I have not watched the whole video and I don't need to watch the whole video because I know exactly what they're going to do. All post tribbers do the same thing. They will go to Mark or Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17 and Luke 21. They all do it. They do not understand that those were not even written to Christians. Okay, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Um, before Jesus dies on the cross, you are dealing doctrinally with Jews in the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 24 has nothing to do with a Christian, right? And that's very apparent when you actually read it. You know, you, you see the Antichrist sitting in the holy place. What's the holy place for a Christian? The body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's problem number one. Problem number two, Matthew chapter 24 says, pray that your, that your flight's not on in the winter nor on the Sabbath day. Uh, there's no Sabbath day for a Christian today in the New Testament. Um, Paul in Romans chapter 13 verse 9 gives the Ten Commandments that we're supposed to follow, and he doesn't say a word about the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was given to the nation of Israel as a sign between them and God. Christians do not have to keep the Sabbath day. So... Um, the greatest portion of scripture, which I don't know if they'll cover this or not, but more than likely they won't. Um, they're going to set up straw man arguments. I know that they will. They'll go to Matthew 24 and say, see, we can't prove a rapture from here. Well, of course not. It's not written to us. And a lot of the, the big pre-tribber guys like Timothy LaHaye and whatever else, he comes out and he'll try to get a rapture out of Matthew chapter 24. It's not in there. Okay. So they'll use that as a straw man argument to knock down the pre-trib rapture. But the greatest portion of scripture, which proves that the body of Christ is called up to heaven to be with Jesus Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, the greatest portion of scripture is Ephesians chapter 1. I'm not going to go over the whole chapter, but the whole point is it deals with salvation. 
It deals with the redemption of the purchased possession, and we are sealed until that day, right? And these guys will never touch this because they want you to go into a time period where you can lose your salvation. And ultimately, that's what you have to go um, to if you believe in the post-trib rapture. So, um, yeah. So, let's get started here. We'll start this thing. I'm probably going to do to uh, the the rapture, or the, excuse me, revelation problem about an hour and 18 minutes, and then we'll finish up the rest of this, you know, nutty nonsense. Um, We'll let it go here, and uh, I've been debunking this stuff for so many years. I mean, it's just crazy, but let's go with this, and uh, we'll see. Story that most of us in the West know, or think we know. If you've spent any time in the Christian faith, you've probably seen the movies, read the books, or heard the sermons about a forthcoming supernatural event known as the Rapture. A time when millions of people will suddenly vanish from the earth, just prior to the greatest apocalyptic event imaginable. For Christians, this has become a message of hope and comfort, but it's also been the cause of major disagreements. And even after years of debate, the church is still equally divided on the major questions about the rapture. Okay churches are still equally divided uh, because you have saved and lost let's continue can it really occur at any moment or does the bible speak of certain prophetic and celestial events that must occur first will the church have to face its greatest enemy the antichrist before the rapture or will the rapture no it's the time of jacob's trouble yeah, they don't get that. ...or happen just before he comes on the scene. Join us as we go on a journey through the Holy Scriptures to review and answer the most... The Holy Scriptures. What are the Holy Scriptures? They're going to use new versions. They don't believe in the Holy Scriptures. So, again, a couple of lies already that we've already had. Join us as we go through the Holy Scriptures. They will not be going through the Holy Scriptures. Let's continue. ...critical aspects of the rapture debate. This is Seven Pre-Trib Problems and the Pre-Wrath Rapture. Now, featuring Charles Cooper, I don't know who a lot of these guys are, Alan Huddleberg, uh, Alan Kirshner, David Rosenthal, Ryan Habina. I'm not sure if David Rosenthal is related to this guy. Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church by Marvin Rosenthal. I don't know. But uh, to my knowledge, this is the first book written about the Pre-Wrath Rapture. This was then followed by this nut here, this uh, Dr. Roland Rasmussen. Right there. That guy. Um, this is the uh, post-trib Pre-Wrath Rapture. Right there. Um, both guys were cuckoo birds. Uh, this is the whole Steven Anderson cult and everything, the new IFB, trained by this guy right here, Roland Rasmussen. He was also associated with Kent Hovind, Fritz Springmeier, uh, Johnny Todd, uh, a lot of very interesting connections there. And uh, Paul Wittenberger, he was in the Framing the World um, documentary after the tribulation. He's dead and in hell now, so that's a good thing. Um, just total mind control cult out there at his Baptist church. I mean, I got letters from some of his people, you know, and just how dare you attack Dr. Rasmussen? Oh, I owe everything to him. You know, he's my Lord and Savior kind of an idea. I mean, yeah, but uh, let's continue. <laughs> Over the years, many different views about the timing of the rapture have been proposed, but the rapture debate has been especially active in the last decade or so. And as a result, there have been some major shifts in the way that the scholars have been teaching them. For example, if you studied one of the more popular views, pre-tribulationism, 20 or 30 years ago, 
you probably wouldn't even recognize what is being taught in the seminaries today. Part of the reason for these some which is precisely why I'm against seminaries. <laughs> sometimes drastic changes in pre-tribulational theology has been a direct result of criticisms from scholars holding to the pre-wrath position on the rapture. See the book? Right there. Like I just got done telling you. They're showing the book that I have right here. Okay. Let me read you a quote that they will not uh, show you. It's on page 265 right there. Okay. I'm not going to show it up close. I'll just read it. Perhaps at this point, an important question must be answered. If the thesis of this book is correct, if the church is to be raptured pre-wrath at the opening of the seventh seal, and therefore sometime within the second half of the 70th week of Daniel, why has this position never been enunciated before? It's a new view, in other words. Why only after more than 1900 years into the church age does, the, does this view appear on the scene? It is simply a new and is it simply a new and fanciful position set forth by an extremist? This is a legitimate issue deserving a satisfactory response. And he goes on to say, you know, well, you can kind of imply that the, you know, and the whole thing, but it's a new belief. So, yeah, let's continue. Which has massively gained in popularity in the last 30 years, overtaking the mid-tribulation position, for example, by a significant amount. But most of this debate has taken place among scholars in theological journals and in university lecture halls, so it's not something the average Christian engages with. And even most pastors aren't aware of the intricate arguments that the theologians have been wrestling with the past few years. In this documentary, we interviewed many... Uh, let me just break down another part of this whole thing. Why are there debates now? Oh, because, as opposed to the early 1900s, because back in the early 1900s, they had one book. You see, now, oh, there's all these new versions, and it brings up a lot of new questions, you know. Yeah, a lot of the new versions that had Jesuits openly sitting on the translation teams. And a lot of the pastors now have been trained by Jesuits and Roman Catholics. Why are all these modern churches now all of a sudden okay with Catholics? And by the way, the Catholic Church has always taught that the church... The historic church, you know, goes through this final time of purification. It's in the catechism. I've showed it so many times over the years. The Catholic Church teaches that they go through that time. Why? Because the Catholic Church teaches that they have the spiritual and the temporal swords. The spiritual sword is that they have the right to control all churches. The temporal sword is that the Catholic Church controls all governments. So how could the Catholic Church be caught up for seven years, the worst time period on earth, when it's they who are supposed to be controlling all governments? And again, I've showed you, showed that the, the church teaches right there. My Jesuit fathers of St. Mary's College, Roman Catholic doctrine. So the church, the Catholic Church cannot teach that they go up and are caught up to be with Christ while events are going on down here on the earth. So who's really the post-tribber out there? That'd be the, the uh, Catholic Church. So as the Catholic infiltration of the Protestant churches happens more and more, of course there's going to be more people attacking the quote-unquote pre-trib rapture. Think about that. If you're not pre-trib, you've been led astray by some papist. I'll tell you that. You didn't get it from Scripture. Let's continue. Scholars, theologians, and pastors who hold the pre-wrath position on the rapture and ask them to help us determine the most critical aspects of the rapture debate. We then distilled these arguments down to the seven pre-trib problems, which we will present one by one. Before we present the first problem on our list, we need to understand the basics of the main rapture timing positions. Most rapture views teach that the end times are played out over a period of seven years. This seven-year time frame is sometimes called the 70th week of Daniel because of Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, where the seven-year period is first introduced. The disagreements primarily concern when the rapture happens and when the wrath of God, known as the day of the Lord, begins, in relationship to that seven-year period. Pre-tribulationists believe the rapture can begin at any moment. 
But what? Uh, correction. Those who believe the imminent rapture theory, which I do not. I used to. I used to teach that because it was how I was taught. And I asked some questions. Wait a second. This doesn't make sense. If the rapture is imminent and that it could have happened at any time throughout church history, then that makes no sense at all. If it happened in 1400 AD, we'll say, then you have from 1400 AD till 2000, whatever, 23, 33, you know, 53, whatever, when, whatever the time of Jacob's trouble gets started, you'd have to have from 1400 to then of what? See, doesn't make any sense. The body of Christ will be here until right before the time of Jacob's trouble gets started, and then we leave. At that point, it will be imminent. Okay, so I still do believe in partial partial imminence. Let's come up with a new term. <laughs> uh, I still believe that there will be an imminent time. There's, We have no idea when it's actually going to occur. But to say that it could have happened in Paul's day, and it can happen, you know, a thousand years later or today at any time, uh, it's not correct. Okay, it will happen right before the time of Jacob's trouble gets started. But what's the day or the hour? I have no idea. Nobody does. Unless you're Robert Breaker, you just every year pontificate September 23rd, you know, every year. And hopefully you'll hit it one of these years. <laughs> so, you know, he doesn't have to worry about being stoned for being a false prophet. So not a big deal. But you get good views on YouTube and good monetization money. So, yeah. Whenever it does happen. It will prove to be just before the seven-year period begins, and that the entire seven-year period is the day of the Lord. Mid-tribulationists believe the rapture occurs at the midpoint of the seven-year period, and the last half of the 70th week is the day of the Lord. Post-tribulationists believe the rapture occurs at the very end of the seven-year period. Most post-tribbers believe that the day of the Lord is a literal 24-hour day occurring at the very end of the seven years. It should be said that some post-tribbers believe the day of the Lord is longer, specifically that it will start at the midpoint and continue to the end, but that the church will be supernaturally protected through the wrath of God until the final day when the rapture will take place. The pre-wrath view teaches that the rapture occurs at some unknown time after the midpoint. They say that no one knows exactly when the rapture happens, it could be weeks or it could be years after the midpoint, but that it will be after the midpoint. They teach that on whatever day the rapture does occur, the day of the Lord's wrath will begin on that same day. Pre-wrathers therefore believe that the church will face the persecution of the Antichrist that be. Oh, really? Okay. And what happens if they take the mark of the beast? See, we have a problem. Because Ephesians chapter 1 Let's go here very quickly. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the in earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. See, these guys have no clue about that. You can lose your salvation. You're going to be going into a time when God's wrath is going to be poured out and it could hit you and, and you lose it. It's a problem. And by the way, um, how is releasing the Antichrist that starts the time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation as they're falsely calling it here? How is it that that is not God's wrath? When God opens the first seal and the Antichrist is poured out, you know, comes out and goes forth conquering and to conquer. How is that not God's wrath? It's always confused me about these people. They just they play little word games, little head games to try to wreck your faith. It's incredible what these guys are. That's why they're heretics. Let's continue. Begins at the midpoint of the seven year period. But that persecution is said to be cut short with the rapture. Basically, the idea. Okay, Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 17. What I mean, what did I say at the beginning of this thing? Let me just back it up here just a, a tad. Persecution of the Antichrist. That begins. See, it's all Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> posties, uh, pre rathies whatever you want to be called. Um, Christians are not in the Old Testament. We're under the New Testament. Why are they citing all Old Testament, all pre-crucifixion passages? A little messed up doctrinally there. 
ends at the midpoint of the seven-year period, but that persecution is said to be cut short with the rapture. Basically, the idea is that on the very day that God's people are out of the way, the wrath of God known as the day of the Lord begins on the rest of the world. I'll explain all the details and the reasonings behind most of these positions as we progress, but there is one more term that really needs defining before we go any further. Recently, it has become something of a tradition to refer to the entire seven-year period as the tribulation period. This is actually, it's not called the tribulation period. <laughs> you know, and I get these posties, they, always, they all do the same thing. Well, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, immediately after the tribulation. See, there's the title. Uh, no, it says the tribulation of those days. It's a description. It's not a title. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 is the time of Jacob's trouble, which these guys will avoid like the plague. Because if you look at that title, then it says it's the time of Jacob's trouble. The Jews have rejected Jesus Christ. That's why the Lord has to reveal himself, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible. He reveals himself through signs and wonders. The Jews require a sign. It's so simple. But you get a bunch of lost heretics and they have to get people all confused on this whole thing. It's just insane. So there's no the tribulation period. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. This is unnecessarily confusing since there is a recognized theological term called the Great Tribulation. And almost all a recognized three theological term called the Great Tribulation. They just lied again, unless it's some new version. See here, this is the problem when dealing with new version people, because there might be one somewhere out there that says the Great Tribulation as a title. I have no idea. But in this King James Bible, the greatest book that's ever been written, there's not one word about the Great Tribulation. All biblical scholars, regardless of their view on the rapture, no. recognize that the Great Tribulation is specifically the time of the Antichrist persecution, which begins after the midpoint. In other words, in order to... So the Antichrist isn't persecuting anybody at the very beginning when he goes forth conquering and to conquer. Okay, see, we're dealing with liars here. That's why, like I said, I was watching a little bit of this and I just thought, oh man, this thing's so jumbled up and messed up. <laughs> but let's continue. To avoid confusion with the Great Tribulation, we will refer to the seven-year period as either the seven-year period or the 70th week of Daniel in this film. Or the time of Jacob's trouble, as it's called in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. You could do that, but then that would give it away. So, you know. The first pre-trib problem on our list is called the precursor problem. And in order to understand it, we need to first talk a little about the so-called day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is an Old Testament concept for when God shows up uh, in history and finally in the end uh, to judge his enemies and uh, sometimes to vindicate or rescue his people. It really means the time of God's wrath in an ultimate sense, when God will pour out his judgment, his vengeance on a wicked world. Scripture explicitly on a wicked world. Then what's the church doing? Do you realize the church is the body of Christ? Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Paul is, you know, Saul was persecuting the church and Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9. And he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So God's going to pour out wrath on the body of Christ along with the wicked world. And <laughs> let's continue doesn't make any sense. It declares that the saints will not experience the eschatological wrath of God, the wrath of God that is typically associated with what we call the day of the Lord. Therefore, the question, in my opinion, the really the only question uh, is when does the wrath of God begin? As mentioned earlier, pre-tribulationists teach that the entire seven-year period is the wrath of God, and that the rapture will occur just before it begins. 
Importantly, they also believe that the rapture is imminent, meaning that it can happen. No, no, you're a liar. There are those of us that understand that it's not imminent in the sense of it could have happened from Paul till the present. That's not true. All right, that's one position that people can take, and it's a false position. It will be imminent when we get closer to the, to the uh, time of Jacob's trouble, but it's not imminent right now. At any moment, and there are no prophetic events that must come before the rapture. That's not true. Again, another lie. There are a bunch of things in the Pauline epistles, you know, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with, hot, with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. You know, the time will come when they will not endorse sound doctrine. In the last days, perilous times shall come. There's a bunch of prophecies that we're supposed to look for. So see, they're lying. What do you expect from lost, hellbound uh, church people? However, there are at least four events explicitly stated to come before the day of the Lord. Old Testament, Old Testament. And you're going to see right here, it cracks me up. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I'll just show you this really quickly. It's another favorite tactic of these lying devils. They'll say right there, you know, that uh, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, you know, and, that, and that's where they stop. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but then you go down to here and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. They will not cover these verses. They'll stop at verse 5. And that's it. They don't go any further. Typical posty thing that they do. Let's continue. In scripture, Elijah will be sent before the day of the Lord. A rebellion or apostasy will occur. The man of lawlessness will be revealed. No, the man of sin. Okay. Um, I mean, it's just confusion. These new stupid versions. Let's continue. Healed before the day of the Lord. Also, a very specific series of cosmic... Okay, hold on. I have to go back there just to show that they're lying here. Um, <clears throat> the fact that the day of the Lord has come through... Let no man will deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Rebellion. No. I mean, it's, just, it's insane. And then it says, you know, before, it has to, this has to happen before this. Lord. Also, a very specific series of cosmic disturbances will be given as a sign before the day of the Lord. Now, this is a very big problem for uh, pre-tribulational imminence, because as pre-tribulational imminence is defined, there are to be no precursors, no necessary precursors before... They're lying. I just gave you a bunch of prophecies that are in the Pauline epistles. They're lying. See, so they build the little straw man argument with lies, and then they knock it down and say, see, we've proved it. <laughs> you haven't proved anything other than the fact that you're liars. But that's why you have your church building and everything else, and you use new versions from the Vatican. For the coming of the day of the Lord or the coming of the rapture. But we have explicit declarations in the Bible that we have several precursors that have to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Pre-tribulational teachers admit themselves that if you can find one event that will occur before the rapture, then it contradicts imminence theology and hence it contradicts pre-tribulational theology. Well, definitely the fact that the, the scriptures uh, uh, tell us that there are going to be precursors to the day of the Lord is an argument against pre-tribulationism. To clarify, based on where pre-trib teachers have traditionally placed the rapture, if these four biblically prophesied events occur before the day of the Lord, it means there are, in fact, events that must come before the rapture, the very thing pre-tribbers say cannot occur. 
Okay, so they're basically saying that, again, this whole thing of the day of the Lord is this whole time period and whatever else. And then you get, you know, the, all the things of the time of Jacob's trouble have to happen before the day of the Lord. But well, then that would be post-trib. It's just this whole thing's just so messed up. It's just insane, you know. And we're not saying, I, see, again, see how they shifted things. See the clever way that they shifted things. I thought we were talking about the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. Well, now it's become the day of the Lord. Huh? No, I'm not saying that the catching up, it's the day of the Lord is the is the seven years, the whole thing. and what it, I'm saying it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Let's stick with the Bible, what the Bible says here. It's really bizarre. And but just to say this, because this is rattling my brain what they're trying to say here with all these lies the day of the lord is not the entire seven year time period so to speak what i'm what i'm seeing is that the day of the lord basically goes into the millennial kingdom it starts and goes through this time period of god's judgment and ultimately that final day of the lord you know but i mean again we we departed from the bible what the bible says here about the time of jacob's trouble and Daniel's 70th week. It's weird. We will discuss several of the precursors in other sections, mm -hmm. but I want to focus on one in particular here, found in the book of Joel. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Okay, let's actually see what the King James Bible has to say. Joel chapter 2, what was it? What verse uh, 31? Joel 2, 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Sounds better. <clears throat> Joel 2, verse 31. Many of the Old Testament prophets wrote about this time, the day of the Lord, the time of God's wrath. And almost every time you read about it in the Old Testament, you're going to find it connected with something that I term cosmic disturbance. Something happens to the sun, the moon, and the stars. Isaiah 13, uh, other passages in the Old Testament present these cosmic disturbances that will be uh, signs that the day of the Lord has arrived. Okay, <clears throat> now let me show you what these guys are doing. They're going to take you to Matthew chapter 24 and compare it to Joel and the, all these other things in the Old Testament. And they'll say, see, so that has to all happen before we can be caught up. Um, well, that's a problem. Let me show you. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 15. When the mystery of the catching up of the body of Christ is revealed. They won't talk about that either. Behold, I show you a mystery. Paul says. Now, why would Paul say that if the sun and the moon darkened and the stars falling from heaven and everything else, and it's been revealed all through the Old Testament? Why would Paul call it a mystery? Because it's not the same thing. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Trump is the sound of the, the voice of the trumpet. Trump is only used two times in the Bible. King James Bible, the new one version say trumpet, by the way, they changed the word trump. And that is <clears throat> first, that first Corinthians 15, first Thessalonians chapter four. And you compare it to Revelation chapter four, where John's there and he hears a voice as it were a trumpet talking with me. Okay. Again, a huge, big study there. But the whole thing is, um, it's in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's a mysterious event. It's not when you look up and you see all these signs in heaven, and then you go up. See, that's the mistake that posties make. That's what the, the mistake of these people. That's what they're doing. So let's continue. I mean, I'm so familiar with these arguments. I've been arguing with these idiots for years. Joel explicitly states it's going to happen before, not during, before the day of the Lord. This is so important because there are two prophecies in the New Testament about when this particular celestial sign takes place. The first, in Matthew, makes it clear that the sun, moon, and star sign occurs immediately after the tribulation of those days. 
and everyone agrees that those days in context is a reference to the persecution that begins directly after the abomination of desolation, which theologians call the Great Tribulation. So if you see how they lied again, I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Let's go back here. Up here in the text, <clears throat> it says, uh, right there, for then there will be great tribulation. And he says, theologians call the great tribulation. Watch him do it. They turn it into a title. It's not a title, it's a description. There's immediately after the tribulation of those days. And everyone agrees that those days in context is a reference to the persecution that begins directly after the abomination of desolation, which theologians call the Great Tribulation. Which theologians call the Great Tribulation. They just lied again. <laughs> it's incredible. And I realize that there are quote-unquote theologians that call it the Great Tribulation, but it's, that's not true. You're changing what the Bible says. <sighs> So if you compare Joel 2, verse 31, which says that this sign occurs before the day of the Lord, with the passage we just read in Matthew that says the cosmic sign comes after the great tribulation, which begins at the midpoint, you have explicit evidence that the day of the Lord is not seven years long. But I didn't say it was. Weird. Rather that it begins at some unknown point after the middle of the 70th week. We see this confirmed in Revelation chapter 6, where it says that this celestial disturbance sign occurs at the so-called sixth seal, and even most pre -trib Which is the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, yeah. Tribulationists will agree that the sixth seal in Revelation takes place after the midpoint of the seven-year period. We will talk more about Revelation 6 and the seals in another section. But for now, let's see how pre-tribbers try to explain some of the things we have brought up so far. Surprisingly few pre-trib scholars have addressed the precursor problem at all. But of the few that have, they present three possible solutions. Dr. Richard Mayhew, a very accomplished and well-respected pre-tribulational scholar, chose to simply agree that there were precursors to the day of the Lord connected to the midpoint, and that the day of the Lord must therefore start after those precursors after the midpoint. But I'm inclined to follow more along the lines of Dr. Richard Mayhew, who argued that the uh, typical uh, long-term historical aspect or thinking regarding uh, the beginning of the day of the Lord probably needs to be rethought uh, among uh, pre-tribbers. As you may have noticed, this timeline of Mayhew's is pretty much exactly what the pre-rathers teach, with one very important exception. Mayhew places the rapture the same place that pre-tribbers always have, just before the seven-year period starts, whereas pre-rathers place the rapture just before the day of the Lord starts, at some unknown point after the midpoint. Mayhew does this because he is still a pre-tribulationist, and so he can't compromise on the idea of imminence. Therefore, he can't allow these events to occur before the rapture, as it would destroy the idea of an any-moment rapture. Okay, so we're no longer with the Bible. Now we're dealing with what men teach. Okay. Thing, see, it's, this thing is so messed up, so jumbled. Let's continue. So while he allows for these events to occur before the day of the Lord, he moves the rapture well before the day of the Lord, so there are still no events that occur before it. Uh, okay, this does not occur. These things here do not occur before the catching up of the body of Christ. I can demonstrate that very easily. Right? The body of Christ is what is withholding keeping the Antichrist from showing up. How do you know that? Because John in the book of Revelation gets called up before the Antichrist is revealed. And when he gets there, there are 24 elders that are crowned in heaven. And then a great multitude of angels around the throne. Less than 200 million, essentially. I mean, not that hard. It's not that difficult. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. 
These guys won't handle that. They can't handle it. Pre-Rathers have come to call this method of dealing with the precursor problem the gap theory. Basically, <laughs> this theory places a significant gap of time between the rapture and the day of the Lord. In Dr. Mayhew's view, the gap is over three and a half years long. But there are slightly different takes on the gap theory out there. I don't care. <laughs> For example, pre-tribulationists like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who recognize various aspects of the Fruit precursor tree? problem, <laughs> but That's still... Good. Wouldn't that be in German, Fruchtenbaum? Wouldn't that be fruit tree? <laughs> That's telling. Well, let's continue. People want to maintain the traditional pre-trib view that the day of the Lord is seven years long, have to do something a little more radical. They assert that the rapture happens at some undefined but significant amount of time before the seven-year period even begins. It has to be a fairly long gap to accommodate all four precursors, though there has been no attempt to define exactly how long of a gap it will be. Both manifestations of the gap theory have the same fundamental problem, which is that... Uh, the gap theory is a, is a thing about, was there a earth that existed before Adam and Eve were created, and God destroyed that earth, the first earth, and then he said, you know, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's, that's the gap theory. I mean, these, these guys are in some different realm that I don't even know about. You know, I would totally avoid it, you know, going to their seminaries and whatever else in this... Yeah. That Jesus teaches that the rapture and the beginning of the wrath of God are back to back events that occur on the same day. And if that is true, there can be no gap between the rapture and the day of the Lord. One of the reasons people on all sides of the debate have historically placed the rapture just prior to the day of the Lord with no. How do we get to the day of the Lord thing? That's why I keep going. It's confusing here. I thought we were talking about Daniel's 70th week. From now on, we will call the, you know, this time period, instead of the Great Tribulation, we'll call it the seven-year period or you know, Daniel's 70th week. But now we're on the day of the Lord. Boy, desperate to prove some things here. No gap is because of Jesus' teaching in the Olivet Discourse, which says, But concerning that day... Back to, back to Matthew chapter 24 again, using a new version. That will continue. Day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as... Actually, the uh, Matthew chapter 24 there. Let me show you this one real quickly. Again, why you don't want to use new versions. Matthew 24, what did they say? Verse 36. Yeah, 36 through 39. Notice it says, nor the sun right there. Uh, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Doesn't say anything about nor the sun. So they added that into Matthew 24 in this new version reading. So, yeah. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And in Luke's account, the parable of Lot is added to this. Likewise, Luke 17, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. All posties will go to these places and say it's for Christians. It's completely an error. It's just, I know how to pin these guys just like that. It's easy. Wise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. They are at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, it's insane. I mean, think about it this way. He's got, you know, how do we reconcile Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and Luke 21 with what we read in the Pauline epistles? Yes, well, um, why don't we go back to Leviticus and try to reconcile that as well? You know, how do we live by faith when um, we're supposed to also sacrifice animals? And, uh, you know, they're going back to Old Testament teachings 
in the Gospels there, before Jesus died on the cross, a testament is a force after men are dead. Okay, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17, read it. See, you're dealing with lost people that have, they don't have the Holy Spirit. That's why there's so much debate in the Protestant churches, because you're dealing with people that are lost. Let's continue. Going, they are back to back. And we see that pattern throughout Scripture. Like with uh, Noah, it was on the same day when Noah entered the ark that the floods came. Furthermore, uh, with Lot, it was on. Um, and Lot went through the flood. Okay. Um, yeah. The same day that he uh, exited, that the wrath came and fire came upon Sodom. Really, the rapture. Okay. Hold on there a second. I have to make a little comment about that. Um, let's get back here for a minute. Triggers the day of the Lord because now back to back. And we see that pattern throughout Scripture. Like with uh, Noah, it was on the same day when Noah entered the ark that the floods came. Furthermore, uh, with Lot, it was on the same day that he uh, exited that the wrath came and fire came. Okay. <sighs> Roman Catholic paintings, you have to love them. So here you have Lot apparently leaving with his daughters, and there's his wife that turned into the pillar of salt. He has three daughters? I thought it was two daughters. I mean, wasn't it two daughters? Upon Sodom. Really, the rapture triggers the day of the Lord because now it is time for retribution for vindication this idea that the righteous would be rescued on the same day that the day of the lord began is probably why the new testament oh man i mean this thing's so messed up it's insane look i'm going to make a comment but we'll continue writers consistently spoke of the day of the lord as good for believers but bad for everyone else it is the day we will receive our rewards and be with Christ, but it's also the day God's wrath will be poured out on the world. This is why Peter said we should look for and hasten the day of the Lord. Uh, it's why. Uh, 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 hold on there. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Ah, man, it's hard to get to. It's consistently spoke of the day of the Lord as good for believers, but bad for everyone else. Okay, I'm sure I'm not going to go through all these passages here, but it's probably not even saying day of the Lord in a lot of these places. But watch what they do here. Else, It is the day we will receive our rewards and be with Christ. It doesn't say day of the Lord. <sighs> but it's also the day God's wrath. Day of wrath. Let's say day of the Lord. It will be poured out on the world. This is why Peter said we should look for and hasten the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, hastening the coming of the day of God? In their new version, he says the day of the Lord. <laughs> just lied. You know, just, what do I say to this? I mean, it's just, you know, Brother Brian. I mean, and those of you that said, could you please refute this? Yeah, you're not fooled by this nonsense. But the people that, you know, 287,486 views, 4.9 thousand people thumbs up this stupid piece of junk. You know, they just lied. The day of the Lord, hastening to the day of the Lord. It says day of God. What are you talking about? The day of the Lord. And they're dealing with a specific title, day of the Lord. So you can't say, well, day of the Lord, day of God. It's the same thing. It's, they're dealing with a specific title, day of the Lord. They say, these passages say day of the Lord, and then they show you a bunch of passages that don't say day of the Lord. And I'm supposed to take these people seriously. Oh, that's right, because he has a church building. And I don't have pews behind me or a pulpit and stained glass windows. Well, I do have that. The window over there is kind of a stained glass window, but it's, it's not churchy. Okay. <laughs> Let's continue. It's why Jesus said, when we see the sign that the day of the Lord is about to occur, we should lift up our heads. A wicked and adulterous nation 
generation seeketh after a sign. The Jews require a sign. The time of Jacob's trouble, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the church needs signs. Oh, yeah. We need to see signs in the sun, moon, and stars. <sighs> because our redemption draws nigh. This draws nigh? Uh, what? Your redemption, redemption is drawing near. Why would he quote the King James Bible? Draweth nigh. See how these guys are deceivers? That's not the Holy Spirit in these guys. It's incredible to me how these guys will just lie. I mean, they put the scriptures on the screen and change the scriptures. If you've been deceived by this movie, please repent. Okay, these guys are liars. May the Lord rebuke every one of you devils in this movie. This idea that the rapture happens on the same day that the day of the Lord's wrath begins is very conservative theology, no, believed isn't. from the earliest days of the church. It's actually still believed... Uh, earliest days of the church? What church? What church? Where are all the writings of the early Christians? Oh, we have the church father. Oh, you mean the ones that the Catholic church preserved? That's another thing that these posties love to do. They'll go back to the... The church has always taught this. The church, the church. The Catholic Church burned the writings of what they called heretics, put them to death and burned their writings. And they preserved what they wanted preserved. And that's what we're supposed to base our truth on. By the majority of pre-tribbers, it is only those who have realized the implications of the precursor problem who have begun to seek out alternative theologies about the timing of the day of the Lord in relationship to the rapture. The third way pre-tribulationists have attempted to deal with the precursor problem is to claim that there are two days of the Lord, one that is seven years long and another 24-hour day of the Lord associated with Armageddon. <laughs> this theory allows them oh, to have all the precursors take place before their new 24-hour day of the Lord, and because they place the rapture immediately prior to the beginning of the seven-year-long version of the Day of the Lord. A <laughs> seven-year-long version of the Day of the Lord. Proof? No. Uh, well, I, we found three guys. Just ignore, you know, other great scholars of the Bible-believing position of the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah. They can maintain pre-trib imminence that no prophesied events occur before the rapture. There true. are a lot of problems with this argument, but the main one is that, as we have seen, the celestial disturbance precursor, which is said to occur before the day of the Lord in Joel 2 verse 31, takes place at the sixth seal in Revelation 6 verses 12 to 14. This Then what's John doing in heaven before the first seal is open, honey bunny? Huh? Huh? Let's not talk about that. I mean, see, people. Please understand, this is what I've dealt with for years. And they come out and they have such this, oh, we have it all figured out. And they're just lying right to your face. How do I handle this? You know, it's so absurd. It's so ridiculous. I, I have no choice but to mock it. It's just, you know, Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal. You know, a man of God will mock ridiculous nonsense like this. You know, disciples come up to Jesus and they say, don't you know you offended the Pharisees? I could care less. Oh, man. Let's continue. This is significant because even though there are some minor disagreements about the timing of the first few seals in relationship to the seven-year period, the sixth seal is almost universally believed to be after the midpoint. So that means this theory would require a third day of the Lord to be added to their list because the sixth <laughs> seal is unquestionably <laughs> after the beginning of the seven-year period and at uh, the very least five months before armageddon how big is this straw man getting now <laughs> the straw dummy well, it's a statue of liberty size i guess by now we know this because the fifth okay. trumpet which is a part of the day of the lord is said to be five months long we will learn much more about the sixth seal and how it relates to the day of the Lord in another section of this film. Oh but needless to say, this third option isn't a very popular one among pre-tribbers. <laughs> in their defense, the precursor problem doesn't leave pre-tribbers with many good options. 
and so the most common way they deal with it is to avoid explaining these problems to their fellow pre-tribbers in the first place. <laughs> I have whole ser sermons on the day of the Lord when it comes in, you know, at the time of, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe it actually when you get right down to it, it starts with Jesus Christ coming back and then that starts the day of the Lord. It's his wrath that comes at Armageddon and then it's boom. It goes a day is what the Lord is a thousand years. So that's the final day of the Lord there. It starts with his final wrath being poured out. It's not the time of Jacob's trouble. And how do we go from Daniel's 70th week to now? The whole time is called the day of the Lord. Oh, man. I see a lot of you just saying, yeah, it's so confusing. Amen. Let's go on to the, now we're going to the Olivet Discourse problem. Yeah. Back to the free crucifixion, Old Testament. <laughs> The second pre-trib problem is related to the Olivet Discourse, which is the name for the teaching about the end times that Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives, recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Christians throughout the ages have believed this passage to be speaking of the signs leading up to the rapture. In other words, they believed that the sign... Uh, there's no rapture in Matthew chapter 24. There isn't anything about the dead in Christ rising first show me dead saints rising in matthew 24 mark 13 luke 21 or luke 17 also some mentions show me dead saints coming up at that time and i will give you a thousand dollars okay show me anywhere where it says dead saints are called up first in those three those three passages it's not there unless you use a new version okay let me let me say that it has to be found in the king james bible because new virgins lord only knows what they say so, and the devil because he's behind them. But let's continue. Signs that Jesus tells his disciples about in the Olivet Discourse are signs that will happen before the rapture, and that the rapture itself is pictured in Matthew 24, verses 30 to 31, which says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will. Tribes? What tribes? Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Um, how could there be the 12 tribes right now during the church age? They don't come back until the time of Jacob's trouble. But that's too deep for these dumb bunnies here. Mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. There are lots of reasons. And where is he gathering them to? Hmm. Mark 13 talks about that. They won't discuss that, though. Since to believe that the rapture is being described in Matthew 24, starting with the clear parallels between the events described in Matthew 24 and the events described in other rapture passages, such as first. Okay. Um, angelic presence. Trumpet call. Uh, actually, if you look and you see um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 7, the dead in Christ rise first. Uh, they don't want to talk about that because there's no dead saints mentioned in here coming up. Um, and it's the trump of God that sounds. The trump of God is heard. Um, they don't talk about that either. Angel blows a tr trumpet over here, the trump of God over here. Hmm universal perception how this is said the same event here is said to be a mystery in first corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 58 it talks about it being a mystery so yeah surviving believers delivered where does it say that over here that you have to survive or something like this it doesn't yeah oh, man this thing thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17 which says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the See the new version? The sound of the trumpet of God. It's not what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17. Just 
making sure I have the scripture thing correct. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Trump of God. The sound of the trumpet of God. No, it's the trump of God. God calls with his voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I call them by name and lead them out. In the book of John, like chapter 10. I mean, the, there's so much deep scripture here with the King James Bible. Okay? New versions completely destroy it because they're satanic. Yeah. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Jesus' description of his coming in Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31, parallels, ideally, Paul's description of the rapture in... No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You're a liar. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And Paul confirms this through many linguistic connections in his first epistle to the Thessalonians. There are tons of parallels, uh, everything from you know, the angels and the trumpet and uh, the gathering of God's. Okay, sudden destruction for ungodly. Um, no, uh, it's not talking about that. Back-to-back -back rapture and wrath. Again, we have trumpet call. It doesn't say that's trump of God. Just trying to see if there's anything else here. Elect will not be deceived. Yeah, again, there it just so many things in here. Alarm that the end has come. Huh? Antichrist temple desolation? Um, okay, no, that's not there. Do not be deceived. Uh, for us, what happens if we are? No, it's just so many things. Elect, trying to but also, um, you know, the thief in the night imagery, the drunkenness versus so sobriety imagery. The problem with this for the pre-tribber is that if the rapture is in view in verses 30 and 31, it leads to the conclusion that there must be precursors or signs before. Okay, first of all, there is no rapture in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. See, again, they set up a straw man argument. We've proved it, and now, no, you didn't prove it. It's before Jesus died on the cross. It's doctrinally in the Old Testament. They're doctors, <laughs> PhDs and THDs and all this stuff. You didn't learn too much there, did you? Maybe learn how to drink as much as you could and whatever else, and you know, while you're in your seminary. But uh, you didn't prove anything. And then they, well, see, we proved that pre-tribbers don't believe in any signs before the catching up of the body of Christ. That's not true. Paul lists a number of them. It's not Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, or 21, but it's things that are written in the Pauline epistles. For the rapture. Because in context, there are lots of signs that happen before the events in verses 30 and 31. For example, a straightforward reading of this passage means that before the rapture can take place, the following events will happen first. A number of smaller signs Jesus calls birth pains. The abomination of desolation when the Antichrist declares himself to be God in the te temple at the midpoint. Oh, in the temple? So Christians are supposed to recognize the temple in Jerusalem? Huh? No, that's for the Jews. See, we're arguing a senseless, pointless thing right now because they're trying to get us back before the crucifixion, doctrinally in the Old Testament. A great persecution like none that has ever been seen in history. A falling away or an apostasy from the faith. And an ominous sign in the sun. Okay, a falling away or apostasy from the faith. Then what happens? To you liars out there. Um, and if you see this video, go ahead and post as many comments as you want. To you liars out there, 
Do you believe that you can lose your salvation? Moon and stars followed immediately by the rapture. As we have seen, the idea of precursors before the rapture is unacceptable with pre-tribbers because it would mean that the rapture is not imminent. In other words, Okay, the rapture is not imminent in the sense of any time throughout church history. See, again, built a false argument. If the rapture is what is being referred to in verses 30 and 31 of Matthew 24, it would mean that there are things that will happen first, that the rapture can't occur at any moment, and most significantly, it would mean that the church will face the Antichrist persecution before the rapture. After the pre-trib view was proposed in the mid-1800s, <laughs> all these problems in the Olivet Discourse were immediately recognized and a new sort of anti-Matthew 24 movement began. At first, they essentially taught people not to pay attention to this section of Scripture at all. They said it was only meant for those left behind, such as Jews or the so-called tribulation saints. Arguments for this would begin by saying things like, Matthew is a particularly Jewish gospel, and because of the Jewish focus of the book of Matthew, this section was not meant for the church. Th um, okay, when did the New Testament begin? Who was Jesus speaking to? Let's totally ignore all that stuff. See, they'll tell you these things, and then they'll say, see, that's not true. Well, why don't we get into the arguments? Because then that would destroy your position. And all, it wasn't until the 1800s, yes, the old 1820 John Nelson Darby thing that these guys just continually pour out and spew out, which I've disproved for so many years. It's insane. Thankfully, this particular line of argumentation has been mostly rejected in recent years. Even pre-tribulational scholars have come to realize its flaws. For example... Oh, so it's no longer... Let's look at the scriptures. No, it's, let's look at different teachers and what they're teaching. Yeah, okay. It's paper. I mean, this is terrible. A bunch of deception. Well, they point out that Matthew might be the most church-focused gospel of them all. It's the only wow. one that mentions the Great Commission and the section on church discipline in chapter 18. In fact, Matthew is the only gospel that uses the word church at all. If you're going to make the argument uh, that Matthew chapter 24 is not for believers, um, are you going to make the same argument two chapters later um, when Jesus institutes the ordinance of the communion? Uh, it's a, it's a real problem of, for pre-tribulation. Ordinance of the communion. Uh, okay, that's mentioned later on in the Pauline epistles, the Lord's Supper. But Paul's never saying we have to keep the Sabbath day. So what happens when lost people try to mess with the word of God? This is what you get. In that regard, pre-tribulationists did come up with one interpretation of Matthew 24 that seemed to stick. In the mid-1800s, they began to teach that verse 31 was not the rapture at all, but some other event that occurred at the end of the seven-year period. Most often, they said it referred to the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, where yeah. Jesus descends to battle with the armies of the Antichrist. Historically, classical pre-tribbers did not, would not allow uh, the, the rapture to be put um, in the proximity of Matthew 24 and 25. They argued that the rapture is nowhere to be seen there, that any Ooh, mention yeah. of a coming of Christ in that passage. Uh, okay, uh, it's nowhere to be seen there. As I said, show me where dead saints come up in Matthew 24. Show it to me. You can pontificate and say, when you, I love one of these guys that are, they think that they're intelligent. They'll say, when it's not, they do this weird not with their mouth thing. It's really, there's a spirit there. I've seen these educated people. It's not, you know, <laughs> makes you intelligent. It, has, it refers to Armageddon. There are lots of problems with this view. For instance, many of the parallels that we see with the Thessalonian letters and Matthew 24 just don't apply to Armageddon. The events in Matthew 24 verses 29 to 31 and the events at Armageddon are fundamentally different. In Matthew, there is a rescue of God's people from the earth to heaven. But in Armageddon, Jesus returns from heaven to destroy the wicked people on the earth. But the biggest problem with the Armageddon view, and the one pre-trib scholars in the last few years have been scrambling to solve, 
comes from the obvious contradictions this view creates with the second half of the Olivet Discourse. So in the latter part of Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, we are introduced to many parables of Jesus concerning uh, the day and hour and readiness for his coming. And from a pre-tribulational perspective, this proves to be a problem in many different ways, regardless of the way it's interpreted, which are various. To set the stage, it's important to remember a basic outline of the Olivet Discourse. The disciples ask Jesus what the signs of his coming will be. Then Jesus gives them a fairly large list of signs ending with the coming itself, i.e., the rapture. In uh, verses uh, 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 uh. The second coming is not the rapture. Okay. <sighs> See, this is why I'm starting to have... You know, memories now of why I just went, uh, I'm not even going to bother with <laughs> debunking this because it's so messed up, it's so convoluted. It's absolutely terrible. I'm going to make a few points here, but let's continue. Try to get through this. Just 30 and 31. From that point on, after verse 31 and going all the way through chapter 25, Jesus tells his disciples various parables about how important it is for them to watch for the signs of his return signs he just got done telling them about. It is in this last section where pre-tribbers have so many problems to solve, because when they... Uh, 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 no, 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 honey. Okay, it's not, did I say it right? Not, uh, the, the rapture's not even in there. There's no dead saints coming up. Show me the dead saints. Caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. Show them to me. Show it to me. And they will not talk about Mark, Mark chapter 13. We'll look at that here in just a minute. Or it actually refers to Armageddon, just plainly. We'll look at that here in just a minute or two. Let's continue with nutty times here. They changed the meaning of verses 30 and 31 from the rapture to Armageddon. They changed the meaning of these parables as well. And these parables just don't make sense if verses 30 and 31 are anything but the rapture. For example, in one of these parables, it says that no one knows the day or the hour of Jesus' coming. And while many laymen pre-tribbers will quote this verse in reference to the rapture, they do this ignorantly. The I agree with that. You shouldn't be quoting that. I mean, it's technically true that no man knows that they are the hour of the catching up, but um, it's, that passage is talking about the second coming, not the rapture. The pre-trib scholars know that if they have changed verse 31 to be about Armageddon, then they must make this not knowing the day or the hour to be about Armageddon. After all, according to them, Jesus wasn't talking about the rapture at any point in this chapter. Yeah. And in context, whatever verses 30 to 31 are referring to is what the parables that follow them have to be about. So they're stuck having to defend the idea that no one will know the day or the hour of Armageddon. The problem here is that we know from several other verses in Scripture that the day Armageddon occurs will be exactly seven years and 30 days. Eh, eh. They got you again. They just lied again. The days are shortened in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why no one knows the day or the hour. So I'll talk about that. After the covenant is made by the Antichrist, and exactly 1290 days after the abomination of desolation at the midpoint. In other words, since it seems very likely people will at least know when the abomination of desolation at the midpoint occurs, since Jesus says people should flee when they see it, all anyone would have to do is calculate the days from that event to arrive at the day Armageddon will occur. Commentaries from pre-tribbers either don't mention this problem at all, or admit it's a problem but offer no solutions. John Mc I just offered you the solution. The days are shortened so that there would be some flesh saved. That's why it says day or hour, not month or year. You'll be able to figure approximately the month or the year of the second coming, but you won't be able to know the day or the hour because those days have been shortened. You're not dealing with 24-hour days towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. MacArthur is a good example of the latter. In his commentary, he says, Nevertheless, even with all those indisputable signs and precisely designated periods, the exact day and hour will not be known by any human beings, not even tribulation believers, in advance. 
although the Lord gives no reason for their not knowing. David Guzik says something similar in his commentary. In this there is a dilemma. How can the day of Jesus' coming be both completely unknown and at the same time be known to the day, according to Daniel 12, verse 11? Another problem caused by interpreting verse 31 as anything other than the rapture is that twice in these parables, Jesus says that one will be taken and one will be left. If this is talking about the rapture, then it flows quite naturally from the gathering in the clouds in verse 31. Where are the dead saints at? They're not there. It's so simple. And it makes perfect sense in context. But because of the pre-tribulational teaching that verses 30 and 31 are about Armageddon, pre-tribbers must interpret this one being taken here as either Armageddon or the sheep and goat judgment. Basically, they must see this being taken as a bad thing for unsaved people. They must interpret it as a wicked person being taken to be judged instead of a righteous person being taken to their eternal reward. It's a full reversal from historical Christianity on this point. In so defense of this, they will point to the parable in the previous verses about Noah, in which Jesus talked about how the flood came and took people away. They say that since the word sometimes translated took in that passage was about being taken for judgment, the flood came and took the unbelievers away. That is how the word taken in verses 40 and 41 should be understood that the one was taken for judgment, not rescue. The truth is the Greek actually precludes this. <laughs> now we have to go to the Greek. The Greek actually precludes this. You know, wow, precludes. You have to be intelligent to say precludes. <laughs> being a possibility. Two different words are actually being used. And it, the one taken is to receive to oneself, to receive warmly. In fact, it's the same word oh. Jesus uses in the departing discourse in John, oh. which I will not leave you, but I will as orphans, but I will come again and I will receive you unto myself. And if I go to make a place ready for you, I will come again and take you, per Lovano, take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. So here, Jesus uses the term paralovano, and guess what? Every pre-trib interpreter believes that John 14, this John 14 passage, when Jesus says, I will take you to be with me, is referring to the rapture. Another argument for this one being taken, being a reference to them being taken in the rapture and not being taken to judgment, is that in the Ten Virgins parable, a few verses later, which is on the exact same subject, uh. which we know because it ends with the exact same warning, watch because you do not know the day or the hour. It is only the wise virgins that are taken, not the foolish ones. In other words, the purpose of Jesus... So some are saved, some are lost. The uh, ten virgins parable is about saving, you know, they're all Christians, but some are lost and some are saved. Lost ones didn't have enough Holy Spirit in their, in their lamp or whatever. <laughs> it's a bunch, of, a bunch of heretics. Just mess things up to prove their point. Jesus' is warning to watch because you don't know the day or the hour is so that you can be a part of those that are taken, not left. Interpreting verse 31 as Armageddon is also logically incompatible with the next parable in which Jesus says the wicked people of the world will be carefree and unaware before his coming. He says they will be marrying and being given in marriage, and eating and drinking, up until the very day of his coming. This creates a huge problem, since according to the pre-trib interpretation, this would mean that the wicked are relatively carefree right up until the day of the Battle of Armageddon, even though Armageddon takes place at the very end of the seven-year period after the trumpet and bowl judgments have been poured out. To put this in context, at this time every living thing in the sea will be dead. All the fresh water in the world will be undrinkable. The sun will be so hot that no one can bear it. Everyone will have been plagued with terrible sores 
and there will have been five solid months of torment from demonic, scorpion-like beings directly from the pit of hell. I could go on, but I think it's safe to say people will have noticed that the wrath of God has started and that they would not be living carefree lives huh? right up until the day the Battle of Armageddon begins. There are precious few pre-trib commentaries that even attempt to justify this idea. Again, the most common tactic is to not mention the problem at all. But pre-tribulational... Uh, okay, um, I was going to make a point here, hoping that they would get through this thing without going off into some other nutty thing and whatever else, but they went off into another nutty area. Um, but let me just show you something here. Let me destroy this whole argument. Well, this, you know, one's taken, one's left. Oh, that's not Armageddon. <sighs> okay. Let me show you a passage of scripture that these guys would not even think of daring to show you. All right. Mark chapter 13. All right. Uh, see where it's we at here. Trying to think of where this is. Or is it Luke? I'm trying to think. I watched a lot of this stuff and it just scrambles my brain after a while. Maybe it is Luke 21. Let me check here quick. That was right down at the end. Okay. I'm just going to type in. My, my brain is not working right now after being scrambled by these wing nuts. Okay. Here we go. Luke 17. Okay. Now look at the tie in here to Matthew chapter 24. One's taken, one's left, the whole thing. Um, okay. Uh, in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And the he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. Exactly in Matthew 24. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. Grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Okay, it doesn't mean they're dancing, by the way, for you modern people. It means grinding at the mill. Okay. Um, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where are they taken? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. What's that a reference to? Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, the Battle of Armageddon. Okay. Uh, and I saw an angel, verse 17, an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, right there you have it, Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Okay, down here you have all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So Luke 17 is where it's talking about it. They won't discuss that. Well, these certain pre-trib scholars say that, um, that there are you know, that this is Armageddon that's in Matthew 24. This this is Armageddon. It is Armageddon. That's what it's talking about. One's taken. It's not that they're taken to judgment. It, they're taken to the place where God's going to come and deliver them. That's what's going on. They go out into the mountains there. So, but yeah, this carefree thing. It's totally weird. Scholars have recognized the various problems that interpreting verses 30 and 31 as Armageddon has caused. And in the last decade or so, there have been two competing theories from them to answer their critics on these issues. One from Dr. Craig Blazing of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. See, we're back to so-and-so teaches this and so-and-so. What does the Bible say? We won't get into that.
it's all about man's opinions. And if you don't like this version, you use that version. If you don't like any version, then you just make up the Greek words. And one from Dr. John Hart of Moody Bible Institute. While Blazing's theory gained popularity from being featured in Zondervan's Three Views on the Rapture book, it's a somewhat convoluted argument, and in many ways it represents an entirely new way to teach pre-tribulationism. As a result, it seems to have had less acceptance among pre-tribulationists than Hart's theory, though it should be noted that in both cases, these theories rely on the same underlying proof text. But more on that later. John Hart wrote a paper in 2007 that simply agreed with the historical church and the pre-wrath rapture proponents that all of the parables after verse 36 are, in fact, talking about the rapture and not Armageddon, thus avoiding the various contradictions we have been talking about. The unique thing about Hart's view is that he maintains that the first part of the Olivet Discourse, including verse 30 and 31, is still a reference to Armageddon as pre-tribbers have taught since the 1800s. So he is essentially saying the first half of the Olivet Discourse has nothing to do with the second half. That Jesus was teaching his followers about the signs leading up to Armageddon until verse 35, and then, for some reason, he reversed the order of events and began to teach parables about the rapture in verse 36. <laughs> So you use some, you go out and you find some pre-trib, you know, professor or whatever that's completely confused and all messed up. And then you say, see, this proves that the uh, pre-trib position is wrong. Oh, brother. Both Hart and Blazing's theories rely on the argument that in verse 36, the Greek phrase peride, which is often translated now concerning, represents a transition to an entirely new topic. In other words, they argue that this Greek term gives them an excuse to decouple the first half of the Olivet Discourse from the second. Hart argues, and Blazing does the same, that the transitional phrase in Greek in verse 36, <coughs> uh, peride, uh, which means uh, now concerning or something <coughs> along those lines, uh, is intended to distinguish or to mark the, the, the change from answering one question to the other. However, since peri de basically means the same thing that the English phrase now concerning does, it can mean now concerning something entirely different, but it can also mean now concerning another aspect of the thing that was just discussed. It's used both ways multiple times in the New Testament. In Matthew, it doesn't necessarily mean that the author is going to a new, entirely different subject. Rather, it means that he may be discussing another aspect of the central focus at hand, which is exactly what's happening in Matthew 24. The peri day line in verse 36 starts off, now concerning the day or the hour. So this is about the specific timing of something. Hart wants us to believe this is the first line on a totally new subject. But the problem is that this line is obviously a continuation of the question about the timing of the events begun in the parable of the fig tree just before this. Okay, the, we're arguing over nothing here. Okay, this they've set up all these false arguments. I'm just trying to prove things. I'm just trying to get through this thing so I can people can't say, well, you skipped certain parts. Uh... The parable of the fig tree teaches that the followers of Christ should be able to determine the general time of his coming by the signs Jesus just described in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 31, and that his disciples could know his coming was near by looking for the signs, in the same way that they could know summer is near by observing the leaves on a fig tree. So with the fig tree parable, Jesus says that we will be able to know the general time but in the next line he says, concerning, or peri day, the day or the hour, i.e. the specific time of my coming, no one will know. It is a qualification then, because we do not know the exact day or hour. So we know the season, but we do not know the day or hour. So these two things complement one another, and they must be taken together. Another criticism of Hart's view revolves around the term parousia, which is translated as coming. 
Since these new views of heart and blazing separate Matthew 24, beginning at verse 36, from the previous section, it would mean the question the disciples asked about the parousia in verse 3 is different from the answers about the parousia given by Jesus in verses 37 and 39. They have to say that what Jesus refers to as the coming of the Son of Man uh, is different from the coming of the Son of Man in Matthew 36 to 41. That's very difficult to maintain exegetically. There's no uh, evidence within the text, not even the, the transitional phrase peride, that suggests he's shifting from one coming to some other coming. <clears throat> I have to comment on the video that is being debunked. I pray that it will lead some of the deceived to the truth about this nonsense. Amen. Thank you, sister, for doing that. Please go leave comments on this idiotic nonsense. I mean, oh, oh, praise the Lord for delivering me from the church buildings and these egotistical windbags. Oh, man. How could people sit there, pay the salaries of these men? Oh makes my head hurt. Um, this is clear because when the disciples ask the question, they say, what is the sign of your coming? And Jesus just uses that same language, his parousia, uh, in both parts of the text. He doesn't give any indication that he's switching topics. The bottom line is that the old preacher view, which has the parables at the end of the Olivet Discourse, talking about Armageddon instead of the rapture, is a brand new argument with multiple contradictions, mm -hmm. and pre-tribbers who know, know it. But the supposed <laughs> fixes for this... Why don't you interview me, stupid? Okay, uh, they won't. They won't bring up uh, real uh, pre-tribbers. You know, it's not even the right term, but, you know, not going to happen. Because I could destroy their whole system, and they know it. So, you know, they're just... All these guys are heretics. They just pretend I don't exist. And if they're brought up, you know, somebody in one of their church buildings brings me up. Oh, he's a heretic. Don't watch him. <laughs> I get letters from people all over the world. You know, I've heard it so many times. Yeah, my church, uh, the pastor hates you. <laughs> it's just because don't watch the guy. He's a heretic. Don't listen to him. He doesn't have a church building. Major problem proposed in the last decade or so, which uh... revolve around the idea that the first and second halves of the Olivet Discourse have nothing to do with one another is an even worse argument. And now, hopefully some of you know it. Uh, well, I, I will say one thing. It kind of brings up a point here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. He that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. Well, we're at the endure to the end of this thing here. I'm sorry to put you know everybody through this. Let's continue. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 4. Okay, multiple errors with your new versions there, but I'm going to tell you exactly what they're going to say. We can't go and see the Lord. The rapture will not happen until we see the Antichrist. That's what they're going to say. Very, extremely easy to debunk. Keep reading. They take it completely out of context. Let me show you. I've done this for many years. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Who's the he? The son of perdition. Who's the his? The time of Jesus Christ. The church age. He might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The spirit of Antichrist is already on the earth. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What is hindering? That's what let means. 
hindering, stopping. What is stopping the Antichrist from showing up? Who is the he? He who now letteth will let the Holy Spirit in the body of believers until he, the body of Christ, be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. All right. You say, well, that's just your interpretation. Okay. Revelation chapter 4. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. John goes up. And what does he see when he gets up there? Uh, let's see where it starts here. Four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and cast their crowns before the throne. There are four and twenty elders, two from each of the twelve boundaries that God set up in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Okay. Revelation chapter 5. Uh, Verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, and every, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. It's talking about redeemed saints of every race, every ethnicity, every nation. You get it? They're in heaven before the Antichrist is released and released in the next chapter. Has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Promise to a Christian. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, a number less than two hundred million, in other words. Okay. Saints in heaven. Next chapter. And I saw when the, the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he, he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering him to conquer. Antichrist is released in Revelation chapter 6. Body of Christ goes up in Revelation 4, is there in Revelation chapter 5, plainly described, and the Antichrist shows up. Simple. Comparing scripture with scripture. These heretics will not talk about the rest of the verses in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All they're going to do in this whole section is simply say, see, the body of Christ sees the Antichrist. Christians see the Antichrist. Because they have to, because their test their faith has to be tested in order to, you know, prove something, I guess, prove who the real Christians are or something like this. They all do it. Let's continue. We'll try to get through this section here. Some good, you know, going to the Greek nuggets and all this other stuff here. Yeah. The most problematic passage for pre-tribulationists is... It's not problematic, princess. I just explained it perfectly. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians was written by the Apostle Paul, in part to refute a false teaching circulating at the time that the Thessalonians had missed the rapture and were in the day of the Lord. Paul's message to the Thessalonians was very simple. He told them not to worry. They had not missed the rapture and were therefore not in the day of the Lord. And so the way he disabuses the Thessalonians from that notion is he says... Another good word. Remember that one. If you want to be a scholar, you have to say disabuses. Certain things have to happen first. Uh, and those things uh, were the apostasy and the revelation of the man of lawlessness, that is, the Antichrist, what we would call the Antichrist. There are two main reasons why this is a problem for the pre-tribulationists. The first is that, as we have seen, pre-tribbers maintain that there are no events that must occur before... <laughs> no, we don't. No, we don't. You're liars. ...for the rapture. Uh. And here, Paul blatantly says, there are two events that must occur first. The rebellion, sometimes translated as apostasy, and the revealing of the man of lawlessness. 
if Paul had taught pre-tribulationism, his simplest answer would be, no, the rapture hasn't occurred yet. Instead of, no, there are certain things that have to happen first. And as soon as you say there are certain things that have to happen first, you've undermined pre-tribulationism. So, <laughs> no, you haven't. I've talked about that. Set up a straw man argument. Me, you guys, every single one of you, your damnation is just. Do you understand? All you guys, you're a bunch of liars. If you're going to one of these guys' churches or if you know them personally, send them links to this video. Every single one of you guys are liars. Said by Brian Denlinger. Uh, Pre-tribulationists have a very difficult time, in my opinion, uh, making Second Thessalonians 2 fit with their, their uh, thinking. <laughs> I just showed how it lines up perfectly going through the scriptures. Second Thessalonians 2 poses the greatest problem for the pre-trip position, or certainly is one of the greatest problem passages for the pre-trip position. Because Paul does exactly what the majority of pre-tribbers say um, does not occur, and that is he gives us a list, a chronology of events, uh, specifically connected to the rapture. We know that Paul was teaching that these two events would occur before the day of the Lord, in part because he uses the specific Greek word proton or protos, which is often translated first and is specifically used oh, here man. to describe when these two events would take place in relationship to the day of the Lord. In the Greek, the Greek is very specific. It uses the term protos, and it means before or... F in, in the Greek, in the Greek, the Greek is very specific. The Greek is very specific. Okay, really? Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, like, totally. Uh, okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> in the Greek. 28th edition of Nestles. Is this the Greek? Texas Receptus, multiple editions of that one. The majority text put out by Hodges and Farstad. What is the Greek? See, they lie. They just, these guys lie for a living. And this is again, let me just kick something here, a little sidekick here. Uh, this is why I hate church buildings, because these guys can be in their little church building and they get everybody just respecting them and honoring them. It's Pastor Appreciation Day. And, you know, anybody like me tries to come along and question them. Oh, shut up, heretic, get out. And so the little world that they live in, the little insulated bubble of their church building that they live in, they're just, you know, oh, we just we're never we're not proven wrong and nobody can see. Nobody challenges us yet because you have a little cult that you're running continue first so paul here is teaching explicitly that two events have to happen before the day of the lord yeah the fact that paul says these things must happen first is important he doesn't just say these things must happen but these must happen first the second problem for pre-tribulationists is that at least one of the precursors mentioned here the revealing of the man of lawlessness is an event that takes place at the midpoint of the seven-year period. And most significantly, this revealing of the man of lawlessness, which Paul describes in saying he will set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God, which places the revealing of the Antichrist at the midpoint. So the coming of our Lord and our being gathered to him. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, the Antichrist shows up at the beginning. That's what starts the time of Jacob's trouble. He confirms the covenant many for one week right so uh, okay he's he sits in the temple showing himself that he is god yeah that's halfway through right but again why don't you keep reading in second thessalonians chapter two why don't you go from five down to verse eight or so they won't do it they never do it i've dealt with these guys for years um, cannot occur until after the midpoint of the 70th week Take a look at this chart detailing the views of five prominent pre-tribulationists about 2 Thessalonians 2, and you get a sense that they have fundamentally different, often... 
I never even heard of half of these guys. I mean, John, these two guys I've heard of, never heard of him, never heard of him, never heard of him. I've preached hundreds of studies and mentioned this thing in all lots of different videos. Been viewed by thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, but they won't talk about me. Mutually exclusive ways of explaining this section of scripture. But despite this confusion, there are... And, and by the way, Ruckman taught a lot of the same things that I teach. Why don't they mention him? He wrote books on it and whatever else. His stuff has been out for a long time. There are some pre-trib arguments about 2 Thessalonians 2 that are more common than others. For example, the most common way that pre-tribulationists deal with this is to say that Paul did not actually mean that these two events would happen before the day of the Lord. Rather, he meant that these two events will happen during or be features of the day of the Lord. For example, in his commentary, David Guzik says of this problem, Paul will not describe events which must precede the rapture, but events that are concrete evidence of the day of the Lord. They are saying that Paul wasn't saying these two events would come before the day of the Lord. Rather, Paul was just naming things that happen during the day of the Lord. Despite this denial that Paul meant these things would happen before the day of the Lord, being one of the most common ways pre-tribulationists deal with this problem, pre-tribulationists never seem to explain why they feel it's okay to ignore the grammar of this passage, such as the Greek word proton which means that these two events must come before the day of the Lord. You can confirm this by looking at other places in the New Testament where the same Greek construction occurs. The same conditional word aeon me, paired with proton, always means one thing comes before the other. Our law doesn't condemn a man unless aeon me, it first, proton, hears from him and learns what he is doing, does it? Uh, Another example of the same construction is in Mark 3, verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless, aeon me, he first, proton, ties up the strong man. Then, tante, indeed the house can be plundered. Mark 3, verse 27. These two examples that share the same Greek construction with 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 confirm that the correct reading here is that before the day of the Lord begins, two events must happen first, the rebellion and the revelation of the man of lawlessness. So at the end of the day, with all these interpretations, the 800-pound gorilla is the word protos. Another popular way that pre-tribulationists try to deal with 2 Thessalonians 2 relates to the word rebellion, sometimes translated as falling away or apostasy in verse... And now they're going to go into the thing of the Greek. You can change it to mean the catching up. You know, Tim LaHaye, I think, did that. So we'll see if that's what they do. I have, this is farther than I actually watched when I originally looked at it and just went, oh, okay, this is giving me a headache. But, you know, whatever. I'm sorry to put you people through this. I mean, it's good for comedy, but that's about it. Verse 3. It is one of the two things that are supposed to happen before the day of the Lord. This is usually understood to mean a... It's live right now. I'm here. Hi. So, this video here is, you know, recorded by a bunch of dead people a long time ago, so... Falling away from the faith. That is, Christians apostatizing or leaving the faith of Christianity. Recently, some pre-tribulationists have put forward the idea that the word behind this word rebellion, apostasia in the Greek, means the rapture. The idea is that Paul was teaching that the rapture would happen first, and then the man of lawlessness would be revealed. This is usually done to preserve the all-important pre-trib doctrine of imminence, that no events can come before the rapture. But in Second Thessalonians, they come to this text, they got real problem, they know it's difficult, they know it poses a great problem for their position. And so what do they do? They take a word, apostasy, say, aha, this word is referring to the rapture, the falling away, the taking away of the believers on the earth. This interpretation has two serious problems. Uh, okay, I, I thought you just got done in the last segment there. 
last little nutty segment saying that pre-tribbers say the taking away is to judgment. Now you're saying taking away means to the rapture. These guys contradict each other. You know, contradict themselves, I should say. The first is the complete lack of any evidence that the word apostasia can mean the rapture. And the second is that such an interpretation would mean that Paul is making a nonsensical and utterly useless point in this passage. Pre-tribulationists claim that the apostasia can mean the rapture because the word is sometimes translated in early English Bibles like the Tyndale and Geneva Bibles as the English word depart. They would say that if the word can mean depart in English, it might also be a reference to the rapture, where believers will depart the earth. The problem is that the word is never used that way. When the early English... Uh-oh. Um, you see, now we go into a little Greeky time here, okay? In Greeky world, you have to talk about uniform translation while covering up the fact that you don't really believe in uniform translation, okay? And this, this is why I tell people, just stay away from all the, uh, what's the Greek word stuff? Because you get into the thing of, what does apostasia mean? Well, according to this lexicon here, it could mean this. Well, yes, but I disagree. This, this lexicon over here says it could mean that. Well, yes, but, you know, it, it just becomes pointless. You look and you say, what Bible produces fruit? King James Bible. It comes from the majority of Greek, extant Greek manuscripts based on that. And other ancient translations and things, too. It's been proven for over 400 years. So let's continue. English Bibles used the English word depart to define apostasia. They meant it to be understood in a non spatial sense, as in he departed from the faith or he departed from sound doctrine. The word is never used to describe physical departure as in he departed from his house or as in our case, he departed from the earth. It always means a non physical departure, such as, for example, a, a political rebellion or a, uh, an apostasy from the faith. The word is used five other times in the Bible, and each time it's used in a political or religious sense, never in a physical sense. Even if you expanded your search to include all of the secular writings in Koine Greek, you wouldn't find the word used in a spatial or physical sense. Show me a historical reference where this word is used that way. Okay, again, they've created a false teaching. Well, there are some pre-tribbers that say that it could actually mean the catching up. Yeah, it's false. That doesn't prove that you're post, you know, or pre-wrath or whatever the thing is, rapture, uh, that it's correct. Ugh. Any writing, any historical writings, 200 years before the New Testament, 200 years after New Testament. In defense of this view, some pre-tribbers will go so far as to committing the so-called root fallacy. What they uh, D. A. Carson, by the way, is a heretic. Stands for the New Versions. Attacks the King James Bible. So they will do is yeah. say that the root for apostasia, which is probably the Greek word aphistemi, can mean <laughs> a physical departure. This method of interpretation is universally rejected by Greek scholars because it's not a reliable way to determine the definition of words. To give you an example from English, the root word for nice in Latin actually means to... These guys embody ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Wow. Amen. <laughs> ...be ignorant, but no one thinks that the sentence, John is nice, has anything to do with John being ignorant. Bringing up the root of apostasia is a desperate attempt to defend a particularly bad theory. The second reason this argument makes no sense is that if the word apostasia means the rapture, then Paul's argument to the Thessalonians is essentially that the rapture can't happen until the rapture happens. The fatal problem with this is Paul says that these things happen before the coming of our Lord and our being gathered to him, which is the rapture. And so it is illogical to say that the rapture must occur before the rapture occurs. What it's doing is it's making Paul say that 
Well, the rapture can't come before the rapture. Want to comment here? You teach dispensationalism. Me? Uh, you teach dispensationalism, futurism, which is Roman Catholic Church counter Reformation doctrine, which came into the Protestant churches 180 years ago, replacing historicism doctrine. Historicism is a teaching of a bunch of retarded Protestants that were just trying to remake the Catholic Church. Okay, dispensationalism and so-called futurism is saying the events of Revelation are yet to come to pass. Duh. Okay, we're seeing the mark of the beast system coming. We're seeing a cashless system coming. All the prophecies are coming to pass. I'm sorry, but you are quite foolish if you think that everything happened in the past historically. Revelation's already done, and we're just kind of floating through time now, and there's no millennial kingdom coming or anything else. Um, you're quite deceived. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, all the Jesuits created it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Manuel Lacunza and all the other stuff and whatever else. He didn't create the uh, pre-trib rapture. It's nonsense. It's, that's a lie. I've been, it's been debunked on my channel. If you're really looking for the truth, you'll find it and see, okay, yeah, no, it's not true. This whole thing of the Jesuits created it. It's nonsense. I can show it from the Bible. To their credit, this apostasia is the same thing as the rapture theory, is openly rejected by the vast majority of pre-trib scholars. Even their own scholars, such as Paul Feinberg and John Walvoord, two of the most esteemed pre-tribulational scholars, mm. have completely rejected this interpretation. See, that's my problem. Two of the most esteemed. I'm not esteemed. Um, oh, that's right, though. What does the Bible say about that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Let's not worry about that. We should probably go to the Greek and get rid of that there. So uh, They haven't even convinced all pre-tribulationists of this uh, who argue that the apostasy in Greek, hey, apostasia, uh, means the rapture. By that, Paul means the rapture. Um, that's a very difficult case to make, if not an impossible case to make. Some pre-tribulationists, who don't want to play the kind of games with the text we just saw, will actually agree that Paul wrote that the apostasy and the revealing of the man of lawlessness will occur first, or before the day of the Lord. Take, for example, John Wolvard and John MacArthur. Both men, in their commentaries, tell their readers that the two events, the rebellion and the revealing of the Antichrist, would occur before the day of the Lord, which, of course, we agree with. But for them, it's a very odd thing to say, since in other places they teach that the day of the Lord is a seven-year period, which is immediately preceded by the rapture. And since both men also agree that the revealing of the man of lawlessness in verse 3 is a reference to the abomination of desolation, which happens at the midpoint, they are essentially saying that something which they know happens at the midpoint occurs before the day of the Lord. The obvious result is that the day of the Lord can't be the seven-year model that they teach in other places. The rapture must Obviously. start sometime after the midpoint. This massive contradiction is not brought up or explained in either. Read the whole context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It makes sense. They won't do it. They will not go from verse 5 to verse 8. They refuse. And then they go and they quote a bunch of heretics that contradict themselves because they're lost just as lost as these guys are. Ugh. Let's get through this. ...of their commentaries. Astute viewers have already noticed another contradiction, which is, how can they teach that these two events occur before the day of the Lord, but not before the rapture? Since, like most pre-tribulationists, they teach that the day of the Lord occurs immediately after the rapture, no. with no significant no. gap, between the rapture and the day of the Lord. No, 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 no. <sighs> oh, man. I've already explained it. Okay, the day of the Lord starts at Armageddon and goes through the thousand-year time there. It's the day of the Lord that brings that final wrath, that final judgment. That's what's talking about, this seven-year period thing. You know, I, I would say I don't know where they're getting it from, but I do. It's just they're reading these other heretics. In other words, since neither Walvard or MacArthur are rapture gap theorists, in their view, if something is before the day of the Lord, it is necessarily before the rapture as well. 
So why are they essentially teaching here what they certainly don't agree with in other teachings? That there are events before the rapture. It's not clear. As I said, they don't mention these serious contradictions in their commentaries. This could be called the forgetful Paul view, because in their commentaries and sermons they will correctly teach that in verse 1 the words coming and gathering are in fact references to the rapture. This is not a debate among pre-trib or pre-rathers. Pre-tribs and pre-rathers agree that this reference, the gathering to be with him in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, is the rapture. But they will go through the rest of their commentaries talking about these two precursors to the day of the Lord as if they are only precursors to the day of the Lord, as if they have nothing to do with the rapture. It's as if Paul forgot to talk about the rapture even though he said that was specifically what he was going to talk about in this section. He says, now regarding the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, let me just stop there. Well, Paul hasn't made any connections here. He's just saying, now I'm going to talk about this. Now, isn't it sort of odd if he says, now I'm going to talk about the rapture and the parousia, and then he doesn't mention it ever again? Well, he actually does. He's, um, he's unpacking what it means. Unpacking it. Oh, why don't we go past verse 4? Because I did. And you can prove that the body of Christ is caught up before the Antichrist is revealed. I mean, why don't these heretics try to come after me? Go through some of my stuff that I teach. Study me like you study these commentaries and whatever else of these other useless guys. And you say, well, you're just too small. Oh, really? 5.03, just over 5,000 subscribers on this channel here. I have just about 45,000 subscribers. And I've been preaching for years. And, you know, you know, why don't you write books, Brother Brian? Well, I'd love to. I'd love to have the time to be able to write more books. But uh, even if I did, they still would ignore me. Yeah. Because they can't handle it. Let's continue. The day of the Lord. Pre-wrath solves this problem by understanding that these two events will occur before the rapture and before the day of the Lord and that Paul is using both concepts interchangeably here, as he often does in the New Testament. Pre-Wrath also understands the revealing of the Antichrist in verse 3 is a reference to the abomination of desolation at the midpoint of the seven-year period. They also see the falling away or rebellion in verse 3 as a reference to the falling away that Jesus mentions in association with the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24. In fact, this clear and consistent connection between Matthew 24 and 2 Thessalonians 2 is a really... Okay, hold on. Let me check something quick. <clears throat> uh, Matthew chapter 24. Uh, okay, again, look at the problem with new versions. And then many will fall away. And they say, see, it, it lines up there, the, the falling away there. 24 verse 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. So see how they the new versions mess stuff up? See, they can tie in Matthew 24 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in this new version because it says fall away. But it doesn't say it in the King James Bible. Uh, Important point. A fundamental problem of the way that pre-tribulational interpreters interpret the Apostle Paul is they don't recognize that Paul is getting his teaching from Jesus. For example, just look at the similarities. In Matthew, Why did he call it a mystery? Behold, I show you a mystery. I mean, yeah, Jesus re you know, referred to it back in Matthew 24. You know, when he talked to his disciples, the people, all of the discourse and all that. But it's a mystery. And th th these guys oftentimes will not touch 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58 either, which is also interesting. Matthew 24, before the rapture in verse 31, what does Jesus say must come first? You guessed it. A falling away and the abomination of desolation. And it's only after those events occur 
that you can expect to see the sign of the impending day of the Lord in verse 29 and the rapture in verses 30 and 31, just before it begins. Jesus' teaching on the end times is a perfect mirror to Paul's in terms of the timing of events, which is probably why Paul said that he got this doctrine about the rapture, quote, from the Lord. How do we know that the Apostle Paul received his teachings from the Olive Discourse, from Jesus' Olive Discourse? Well, we know this. We know this because there are thir at least 30 parallels between Paul's teaching in First and Second Thessalonians and between the Olive Discourse. There's 30 cohesive links between their teachings. It's not just pre-Rathers that see them. So G Paul was learning from the Olivet Discourse. That's what he was referring to. Now, Paul, he talks about getting things from the Lord, which I have to even look up that verse. Might not even say that. Um, when he's referring to it, uh, you know, he's just saying, I'm getting things from the Lord. The Holy Spirit reveals things. Doesn't mean he's sitting there reading Matthew 24 and saying, let me rewrite it a little bit. It's stupid. These guys are so stupid. There's no nice way for me to put this. I think I'm going to end with, when this section's over, I think we'll end it for this week because it's, uh, I don't know if my brain can take much more of this. Let's continue. The connection between 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and Matthew 24. Just check the margins of your favorite Bible. Ever since cross-references have been... The margins are not inspired. Cross-references. We're back to dealing with men again, aren't we? So-and-so did this, so-and-so wrote that, that proves such a... No, deal with the scriptures, but these stupid heretics can't. Invented, they have been linking these two passages. It's only the pre-tribulation. Uh-oh, uh-oh. And you? Hmm. Using a new version there, aren't you? The Nestle Alon United Bible Society text is what NU designates. Whenever you see that in the new version, NU means the Vatican text. Let's see, the gullible people that watch this kind of junk, they don't understand that. They're papists. Let's finish up this section. ...who can't accept that these passages are parallel to one another. If you're a pre tribulationist just, you know, lay your presuppositions aside for a moment and just read Second Thessalonians 2 without your traditions and see... Why would they talk about, if you're a pre tribulationist lay your suppositions aside, your traditions and whatever else, and all of a sudden it looks like they're... Showing a King James Bible. Yeah, they're showing a King James Bible. So they're quoting a new version the whole way through. And then when they attack pre-tribbers and say, oh, lay your suppositions aside in your, in your you know, prejudiced ways. And then they show a King James Bible and an old one at that. You see the satanic little devils that these guys are? Burn in hell. Their damnation is just. Let's finish up. See what it says. See what it says. Guys, a lispy voice too. You know, a little effeminate there. But all right, I'm going to end it for now here. Um, I don't think I can handle much more of this, honestly. <laughs> uh, it's giving me a headache. I mean, I know a lot of you are saying the same thing. Um, ugh. Yeah. Um, so we'll stop there. Uh, if we want to do more, I guess we'll do more. Um, but I have a bunch of things to get done today here. So, uh, but yeah, let's everybody just, you know, take some time, get some fresh air, maybe get something, you know. I, mean, I literally am having, I, I have a little bit of a headache right now. Just, I saw one of you said, you know, you try to be diplomatic here. You try to actually say, okay, I'll listen to your arguments. I'll hear you out. But you start watching it and you just say, whoa, hold on. What? Huh? Let me show you the reason for that. We'll end with a good scripture here. Ugh. Okay. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. 
And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and if the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Um, when you meet a preacher that is saved, that is born again, you'll understand when he's messing, he messed up, he made a mistake. I make plenty. But you'll hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through him. You'll see, okay, this guy's a servant of the Lord. But when you reach a hireling, you just, you listen and it just gets so confusing and you think, what? And it starts to give you a headache and you feel just, I, huh? And it leads to this really confusing, confusing feeling. I've seen this thing so many times over the years. Um, so uh, we'll come back and we'll do more of this fun stuff in the future here. Uh, but uh, I do this for a few reasons. I, I get asked to do it. That's reason number one. Okay, I'll, I'll go along with that. Um, second reason I do it is so that I can help you to refute these issues because these guys are here to cast doubt. As you just saw, the very last scene in this thing here, um, you know, they, let me just go back to it again. And that he got the Oh, that the Apostle Paul, Paul's teaching in First and Second Thessalonians and between the Olive Discourse, there's 30 here. cohesive. Nah. Paul's teaching. Paul's teaching in first and second. Okay, we'll just mute this little effeminate sissy. Their whole purpose is to destroy your faith in the King James Bible. And as you saw here, as they fade out and they're saying about leave your suppositions and everything behind, you know. Since cross references have been invented, they have been cross linking the cross references. Okay, hold on. There's the Nestle United Bible Society text, the NU. Just, you know, lay your presuppositions aside for a moment and just lay your presuppositions aside for a moment as he turns the King James Bible. You see, you see how subtle Satan is. You see how his, you know, the guy earlier there, all oh, down are you teaching Jesuit futurism and, and whatever else? Um, no, I'm not. OK, Jesuit futurism and Jesuit, the stuff, whatever they taught there was actually post trip. I proved that one of my studies. Okay, this whole Manuel Lacunza uh, thing. But you see how these guys are doing this. They have to destroy your faith in the catching up of the body of Christ. They have to do it. And that's why they get their little subtle little hints in there. We use the Nestle Alon United Bible Society text of the Vatican, and we will attack you if you use the King James Bible. Lay your presuppositions, presuppositions aside. All right, that is going to be it. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the way that they do it. Absolutely, though. I mean, why why share the King James Bible? You're not even quoting the King James Bible. You see, why do they attack pre-trib people? Lay your suppositions aside as they flip the King James Bible, and I guarantee it. Nobody in the comments even saw this. They don't pick up on it. Little cues of these Jesuits, these papists. I don't know if any of these guys are Jesuits or not. I have no idea. But they're papists. They're teaching what the Roman Catholic Church has taught. There needs to be a final, final time of purification for the body of Christ. Yeah, forget about the Jews. There are no Jews. You know, it's just the church. It's all about the church. Yeah. So that's going to be it. Um, I'm sorry to put everybody through that. We'll have to endure more suffering in the future. Um, we can have some fun with it, get a good laugh at these guys, but uh, unreal. Um, so we'll see everybody in upcoming studies. Please have a good day. Stand by your King James Bible, the Word of God. Okay, see you in the next study.